Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute, and production of this episode was made possible by a grant from the Roller Bottomore Foundation of Richmond, Virginia. Hello, and welcome to episode 250 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. 2019 marks the 400th anniversary of two important events in American history. And those important events are the creation of the first representative assembly in English North America and the arrival of the first African people in English North America. So for this, our 250th episode of Ben Franklin's World, we're going to investigate why the Virginia 1619 anniversaries are important, why the creation of the first representative assembly and why the arrival of the first African people in English North America matter, and how these events have impacted American history. Leading us on our investigation is Cassandra Newby Alexander. Cassandra is a scholar of African American and American history, the dean of Norfolk State University's College of the Liberal Arts, and a member of Virginia's 2019 Commemoration Commission. Now, as Cassandra takes us through the world of 1619, she reveals details about the Virginia Company and the establishment of Jamestown and the Virginia Colony. When and why the Virginia Company ordered its colonists in Virginia to found a limited representative legislature, and information about how and why the first African peoples arrived in Virginia, and about their experiences and impact in this young colony. But first, as this is the 250th episode of Ben Franklin's World, my colleagues at the Omohundro Institute decided to celebrate, and they decided to celebrate by preparing some bonus materials for you. Firstly, Holly White has created a bibliography that details all the books, articles, and resources that we used to help us think through and create this episode. So if you're looking for more information about the history of early Virginia, be sure you check out Holly's bibliography at fasterlyamerica.com. And secondly, we have bonus audio for you. So if you'd like to know why there's confusion over whether it was the English or the Dutch who brought the first Africans to Virginia, or if you'd like more information about the experiences of some of the first Africans in Virginia, visit vastrallyamerica.com. I've also placed this bonus audio clip in our Ben Franklin's World app. If you don't already have this app, the Ben Franklin's World app is free and available for both iOS and Android devices, which means you can download it right now from your favorite app store. All right, I hope you're ready because it's time for us to explore the history of early Virginia and the world of 1619. Our guest is the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at Norfolk State University. She's a scholar of African American and American history and a member of the 2019 Commemoration Commission, a commission created to mark the 400th anniversary of Virginia 1619. She's authored and co-authored several books, including An African American History of the Civil War in Hampton Roads and Virginia Waterways and the Underground Railroad, plus her current book project, seeks to explore the efforts of Virginia's African-American population to seek freedom and liberty from 1619 through Reconstruction. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Cassandra Newby Alexander. Thank you. Now, Virginia's 1619 commemoration marks the 400th anniversary of two events, the establishment of the First Representative Assembly and the arrival of the first Africans in English North America. Cassandra, I wonder if we could start our conversation with some context for these events. As English North America started with Jamestown, would you tell us a bit about the Virginia Company and how it came to establish a settlement on Jamestown Island in May 1607? Well, you know, if we go back to the latter part of the 15th century, Spain and Portugal, early on, they were the same nation state when they gained their independence from the Moors after a series of battles. And then they became two separate entities and actually started competing with each other. And that's when the Pope made a decision because he did not want his two primary Catholic countries to fight each other. There was the establishment of the Treaty of Tordesillas, and that essentially split the world in half. So Portugal could establish colonies, trading posts throughout the continent of Africa, 
since they had already established a beachhead in South America that was later known as Brazil, the Pope said, you know, you can continue to expand in that area, but all other areas were under the domination of the Spanish. And so that was the world that England was competing with. And they were trying to punch a hole in this shield of domination by the Spanish and the Portuguese. And of course, not being a Catholic country by that time, they really had to find a way to undermine the system that was not going to be an obvious incursion by the English. So that was sort of the landscape going on at the time that the Jamestown colony was being formed. Spain had actually established some settlements in the region we call Virginia, North Carolina today. So when the English had scouted out Jamestown Island, they were happy that it was abandoned when they landed, and they were trying to hide from any passing Spanish ships. You know, for those who don't know the landscape of Jamestown or that area of Virginia, you have to go into the Chesapeake Bay, and that's from the Atlantic Ocean. So it's about seven miles from the opening of the Chesapeake Bay, from the Atlantic Ocean, all the way to the area we call Point Comfort, which is where Fort Monroe is. And then it's another, I think, 10 miles or more around that bend going up into the James River. That's where the Jamestown colony was placed. And so they were hoping to really hide from the Spanish. And so the English, in establishing what was essentially a beachhead in North America in this area that was later called Jamestown, the goal was to, first of all, find a space that the Spanish had not established a colony, hopefully find gold, begin transporting that to enrich the people who were funding this operation because when this group of men formed a company called the Virginia Company of London. Initially, it was the London Company. The hope was that they would find gold. And for the first two years of the establishment of the colony, they were finding what they thought was gold, but it was fool's gold. It was a pyrite that had the appearance of gold. And so the colony was fledgling for almost two decades, So there was really some serious doubt as to whether this investment by the Virginia Company of London would succeed. So it sounds like the answer to the question of why the Virginia Company established a settlement on Jamestown Island was because it was an area that was hidden from the Spanish. Now, you mentioned that the Virginia Company was a profit-seeking body. In fact, it was a joint stock company. Did the company's mission, you know, to seek profit impact the people who worked to establish the settlement at Jamestown? Very much. You know, each of the American colonies that was established, they were established for very different purposes. The Virginia colony was established to make money. It was supposed to only be temporary. They were hoping, just like with the Spanish invading Mexico, that they would be able to force the native peoples to mine gold for them, and they would take that gold and it would enrich their country. So when they found out that gold really didn't exist in this area, they were really seeking some other way to make money. And that's why they were contacting different individuals who had established plantations in the West Indies. They were encouraging them to come to Virginia and to establish some sort of money-making crop or money-making venture in the colony so that it could survive. And so that's why John Rolfe coming to the Virginia Company and establishing a plantation based on tobacco production was so important to the survival, the economic survival of the Virginia Colony. Yeah, historical records definitely paint a picture that life in early Virginia was really precarious for many years. And I wonder if you would tell us why you think the colony struggled as much as it did and how the colony eventually found stability. So if you came to the Jamestown colony, established it in 1607, the majority of people who came were gentlemen. And the definition of a gentleman is one who does not work for his money. 
his money works for him, meaning you were an investor and you pay people to do the work. You may have been the manager, but you certainly did not build forts. You did not build fortifications. You did not do any hard labor. So the majority of people who were here were those who were here to find gold. I don't know if they believed that it was going to be lying around and all they had to do was pick it up, but that was part of the problem. And the colony was about to die out and decay into anarchy because they were not doing those kinds of things that would sustain the colony. You had to build a fort. You had to plant crops. You had to sustain yourself. And they were simply depending upon the supplies coming from England. And hopefully they were going to depend upon the trade situation that they were trying to set up with the native populations. And you can imagine the native peoples were not too happy about trading food with them. And so when John Smith was brought in. He was given the authority by the Virginia Company, and he established the rule, if you don't work, you don't eat. So he finally got the Virginia Company up and running in terms of what was happening on the ground, and that continued. But it was somewhere around 1616 that the company put in place not only an indentured system where They clearly had rules governing people who would sign a contract. They would come in to work for a certain length of time. And after they fulfilled that length of time, they would be granted land, what would later be called a head rights system. And then you had those who were bonded, who came in. And these were whites who were servants, but they didn't have a contract. And they had rules governing what would be the maximum time they would serve. And then afterwards, they would be granted land so that they would not be a burden to society. So by the time the colony was really stabilized and they had a regular crop that was providing them with a booming economy, the company realized that more rules needed to be in place, that it couldn't simply be a governor with a captain to enforce the rules, that instead the colony was now ready to expand and to grow, and the colony needed to have a governing system in place that would also include a court system. And so that's really why, just in a nutshell, the company decided at that moment in time in 1619 to establish this limited legislative body because they saw the future in the colony, that the colony now had the potential to grow and expand. And more and more people were desiring to come to the colony as servants with the hope of living long enough to serve out their time and to get land to also produce the tobacco so that they could become wealthy and prosperous. So we have reached the 1619 part of our story, the year when Jamestown and the Virginia Colony showed long-term promise, and it reached a point where it really did need more rules and better ways of governing its expanding population. Cassandra, would you tell us more about the creation of this first representative assembly in English North America, and who sat in this assembly, and what kinds of governing powers it really had? So the assembly actually met at the Jamestown Fort in the church that they had there. And these were all individuals who owned land, who had a title, who were wealthy. So they were all gentlemen from England. And once they were there in the colony, they had established their own wealth with large plantations, with numerous workers both free laborers as well as indentured laborers. And these individuals, I believe there were about 12 of them, they met together in the church and they were given the authority by the company to begin establishing rules. And one of the first rules they established had to do with how they were going to measure value in the tobacco that was being produced. because. One of the first things you want to do if you're a country and you've got an economy is you want to establish the rules of measurement. So they were establishing what would be the standard for trade within the colony because that really reflected wealth. So 
what's a hog's head? Now, of course, we already know that England had an idea of a hog's head, and that is when you cut the tobacco plant and it's a certain size with the leaves and so forth, that part of the plant is as big as a hog's head. And that would have a certain amount of value on the international market. But what kind of value would it have internally in the colony? And how would that be weighed? How would that be measured? And what kind of exchange system would you need to establish? Because the idea is that the colony would no longer be externally focused, producing crops and sending it abroad, but rather it would also be internally focused. So how would these towns and hamlets begin to interact with each other? How would laws be enforced? How would rules come about? Who would create those rules and how would they be enforced? And so it's at that point that this group of men established what we call a rule of law. But of course, the rule would benefit them. So they established that if you're going to be a representative, and later on, this body would be called the House of Burgesses, because each individual represented a realm. Eventually, we would call that a county, but they would represent that area They were the wealthiest. They owned the largest amount of land. They had a certain amount of wealth, and they would be the ones making the rules. And so this kind of reflected what existed in England with the lords. The lords owned a certain amount of land. They had a certain amount of wealth, and they controlled the population in that area. And this body is the one that later, after it became the House of Burgesses by the 1660s, it would today is called the Virginia General Assembly. And so in these very, very early months and then later years of formation, they would also be responsible for setting up a court system that would take the laws and interpret them. If there were any violations to that law, they would meet out a sentencing process and the legislative body would also create an enforcement arm and govern that enforcement arm. So this really was laying the foundations of what would become a nation. It's interesting. We talk about this first governing body as a representative legislature or assembly, and yet it really only seems to have included gentlemen. Absolutely. Because, you know, it's only in America, and I'm going to go from just a Western point of view. So we're talking about just European society in general. It's only there that you really see this notion that only a handful of people should rule. Now, that's not to say that other societies did not set up a similar kind of system where only a handful of people can rule, but the realm that they ruled under and the rules governing that is very different depending on what society you're talking about. For example, in the Virginia area where the Powhatan Confederation existed, There was no such thing as a monarchy. You did not have ownership of land. The tribal unit or the empire had control of the land, but no individual owned the land, and you did not have an inheritable monarchy. So just because I'm the son or I'm the daughter of the current chief does not mean that once that chief dies, that I would become the ruler. There was no such thing in many of the Native American systems that would create that kind of inheritable power and wealth. But that did exist in England. It did exist in other countries throughout Europe. And so the English were trying to kind of create that kind of system in the American colonies as they were forming. And there had to be some amendments to that. And so the issue is that You know, as they tried to just create the system and govern themselves as opposed to an outside entity, meaning the Virginia Company of London governing themselves, they still remain very small. And most people don't realize that even after the establishment of America as a separate nation, most people don't realize that a handful of people, a handful of people, elected the president. When you look at the numbers, you talk about the Electoral College, 
you look at how few people were able to actually vote and those votes, those electoral college votes determine the election. Those numbers continued to be very, very small until we got into the latter part of the 19th century. And it's then that we begin to see what would emerge as a real, true representative democracy. So America's democratic system, this limited democratic system that was established in 1619, would actually continue to dominate this country until the latter half of the 19th century. You know, we have a different perception of that time period and of our history because we talk about democracy, but we don't really talk about how limited that democracy was and how the overwhelming majority of people did not have a voice. And it really wasn't until the 19th Amendment was passed allowing women of all races, nationalities, creeds, and colors to vote that over 50% of the population was now able to vote. So it sounds like this First Assembly had quite the influence on the development of American government. And now it's 2019, and we're 400 years removed from the creation of this First Representative Assembly. And I wonder, from this 400 years into the future vantage point, how do you think we should think about and view the historical significance of this 1619 Representative Assembly? I think that if we tell the history of America as if it's already writ in stone from our current vantage point, and we ignore the battles of freedom and equality and rights of citizenship, if we don't understand that it didn't just happen, it didn't happen at the formation of the Jamestown colony, it didn't happen with the Declaration of Independence, it didn't happen with the establishment of our second constitution or our first constitution, it didn't happen until much, much later, and not without a lot of effort and sometimes bloodshed. If we don't understand that democracy is not something that is given to us, it is something that people have struggled to have, then we really do not understand the real value, worth, and modeling that America represents. Now, as we said at the start of our conversation, 1619 was a momentous year for English North America because it did see the establishment of this representative assembly we've been talking about. and. Just a few weeks later in August 1619, it saw the arrival of the first African people in English North America. Cassandra, how did the first Africans come to English North America and why did they land in Virginia? You know, it's a really complicated story that I will summarize. What was happening in Europe were a series of wars that we call the Thirty Years' War. And we saw a lot of infighting going on between England, Spain, and Portugal and many of the other nations who were part of Western Europe. And they were fighting over control because Spain and Portugal had gone into the west coast of Africa. The Portuguese established a trading base down in an area they called Angola. And they were allowed to set up trading. And one of the main things they were trading was gold. And they were sending it, they were enriching their country with gold, but also in conjunction with that, they were trading for enslaved people. These were people who had been captives in war because unlike a lot of the stereotypes, the Africans, first of all, they didn't call themselves Africans. They had ethnic associations and you had this ethnic infighting going on within the continent of Africa in the same way that you had the same kind of ethnic infighting going on in Europe. And so whoever was the loser of the battle was enslaved, and these individuals were sold into a slave trade, both internally within the continent and then externally to the Portuguese. And the Portuguese were selling these enslaved people to the Spaniards who were settling a great deal of Central and South America, as well as the Caribbean. And what were the people doing? They were essentially raising sugarcane, but also there was quite a bit of industry going on. They were continuing to mine for gold and silver, 
They were also involved in a whole host of other industries. So it was a very big trade, and many of these other European countries wanted to get in on it. Well, England, and there were some English lords, were secretly funding ships, what we call privateers, and they were set to attack any of these Spanish or Portuguese vessels traveling the high seas. There was a situation that happened in 1619 in which the governor of the Angolan colony contracted out with a group of mercenaries to actually wage war for the purpose of kidnapping people and selling them into slavery. And they were waging war against one of the main kingdoms in that region called the Kingdom of Ndongo. It was known for being very wealthy in terms of gold. So they went into those cities in Ndongo and seized hundreds of people. And they marched them to the Angolan port and loaded 350 of those individuals onto a ship called the San Juan Bautista. That ship left in early 1619 on its way to its main port in Veracruz, Mexico. On the way there, there were a number of people who were ill or who died aboard the ship. So they offloaded about 100 people in Jamaica and continued on the trip. And it was in that period between stopping in Jamaica and going to Veracruz that two English privateers, the White Lion and the Treasurer, and the Treasurer was actually owned by the Virginia Company of London, those two ships attacked the San Juan Bautista and took a number of enslaved people off of that ship and then set sail for the Virginia colony. And according to John Rolfe, John Rolfe went to Point Comfort, which is where Fort Monroe is located. He went with Captain William Pierce, who was also living in the colony. And it's there that they met the ship, first the White Lion, and there were, according to John Rolfe's notes, 20 and odd Negroes who were offloaded or who arrived at Point Comfort. And those individuals were distributed throughout the colony. Some people purchased them and some people like the governors, for example, was simply given a certain number of individuals. And then about three or four days later, the other ship, because for whatever reason, the two ships were separated, that other ship arrived. And new research has found that three or four people were offloaded there and were also distributed. And one of those people, the name was Angelo in the records. Angelo is a Portuguese name that can mean either masculine or feminine. And in this case, it was a feminine reference, which is why they also refer to her as Angela. She was given to Captain William Pierce, and there's currently an archaeological dig on that site where he lived, hoping to find her remains and hoping to make some sense out of the life that this particular woman lived. And so that's how and why the first Africans were forcefully brought here to the Virginia colony. Cassandra, it sounds like you've seen a lot of the different historical records and archaeological artifacts that we have that are related to these first 20 Africans in English North America. So given everything that you've seen, do the records say anything about how the first Africans experienced and contributed to early English society? Do they say anything at all about the Africans' impact in Virginia? Many of the records are either scattered or just brief references. But we do know that very quickly, there were actually a few more African women than African men in the colony by the 1625 census. We would see 17 women and 15 men who were Africans living in the colony. They were in the main households. We can see in the records they were involved in the tobacco industry. Tobacco was the driving economic force in Virginia. One of the things that accompanied the tobacco production was the production of pipes. And the Africans in West Africa already had a specific technique that they used 
in carving out these pipes. And those pipes became a very important selling item in England and actually throughout Europe. And so we know that they were involved in that particular industry. We know, for example, that the English were not involved too much in flatboat trading, but many of the West Africans were, in fact, as we get more into the 18th century and you start to see more West Africans as opposed to West Central Africans being forcefully brought into the colony as well as into other American colonies, they would really be a part of helping to develop this flatboat trading. And because in Virginia, and especially in this region we call Hampton Roads, that goes all the way from Williamsburg down to Suffolk on the south side, you really see the rivers intertwined throughout the landscape. And so the native peoples, they use the rivers as their waterways, and so did the English, but they were not accustomed to using the waterways in the same way the Indians were, nor were they used to using them in the way that the West Africans were. The West Africans came in and applied that particular technology, and it helped, of course, with a booming economy, and it really continued. Africans were very much dominating the maritime landscape and would continue to dominate it even through the early part of the 20th century. We would also see architectural forms being introduced. We would see the evolution of houses that we call the shotgun houses throughout Virginia because of the heat and the summers and so forth. These houses, unlike the English houses that were compartmentalized to help hold heat, you didn't want to hold heat in Virginia. You wanted a breezeway. And so the shotgun house is essentially called that because you could take a gun, shoot it through the house and not hit anything because there's a breezeway from the front to the back door. Native peoples had a similar style of house, but this particular one that was constructed by a number of the Africans became the standard house that was used throughout Virginia. And so we would see Just in those things that I mentioned, the architecture, we would see it in the trading, we would see it in the industries that were here that Africans were involved. But lastly, we would also see a tremendous impact in the religious expression and the culinary arts because Africans were taking their understanding of foods and they were adapting that understanding and those practices to this new landscape. What we call Southern cuisine is really African American cuisine. And so this would have an ongoing impact. And there are many other things, music and dance and so forth, that would be impacted by their presence. But lastly, I would say the law. We would see the emergence of a racialized legal system, first through the courts and then through laws that were passed that would demarcate people of African descent as the other. And this still has a role, a significant role in our laws and our practices today. I very much want us to talk about the emergence of laws and racialized laws in Virginia. But first, I think it would really help us to talk about labor and labor classes. Earlier, we discussed how the Virginia Company stabilized Jamestown in part by introducing systems of white indentured and bonded labor. But in 1619, we now have the introduction of the first Africans. And there seems to be a debate among historians about whether the English considered these first Africans as enslaved people or whether they considered them to be indentured servants. So would you tell us about this debate, why historians are having it, and why these distinctions in labor classification matter? I think it's because of the silences in the records. The records do not say that they were enslaved. It calls them servants. But then you would see practices that suggested that they were not being treated the same way as the white servants. That's where the questions and the debates among historians have emerged. 
You would also see a silence in terms of the law. The law did not talk about slavery. In fact, Massachusetts passed a law establishing slavery at least a couple of decades before Virginia. It wouldn't be until the 1660s that Virginia would say all incoming Africans would be enslaved. And it wouldn't be until the 1670s that a slave law or series of laws called the slave code would be established. But that does not mean that they weren't enslaved prior to that time. And so historians are really asking questions, you know, what was the status of these first Africans who were brought here? Well, they weren't indentured. Indentured meant that they negotiated a contract for their service. So there was no contract. There are also questions about, well, there were some white servants who didn't have a contract as well. What was their status? Well, their status was unknown. And so the issue was, well, were they held in bondage in perpetuity? No, they weren't. Why? Because the English law said that you cannot enslave a Christian. And so this issue of, well, you know, many of these early Africans coming from the kingdom of Ndongo, coming from that area of Angola that also included the kingdom of the Congo, many of them were Christians. So what was the issue? Well, we're finding in the court records, as well as in freedom suits, that many of these Africans were filing in the court system that the English were refusing to see them as Christians, claiming that only a white person could be Christian. So because they were black, there was no way that they could be a Christian. And so you would see this sort of nebulous status. And some historians have argued, well, the practice of slavery was there. So, of course, they treated them as enslaved people. I'm not ready to go there. I think that's a bridge too far. I would say that the status was undetermined and it was allowed to be determined individually by these individuals who were owning them, as opposed to having a colony-wide law that clearly said how they were to be treated. And certainly, there are some legal situations that bear that out. For example, the famous one is the John Punch case. I believe it was in 1639, in which John Punch was an African who ran away with two indentured servants. When they were caught, the two white indentured servants were whipped and they were given additional years of servitude. John Punch was whipped, but his punishment was servitude for life. Now, if he was already seen as an enslaved person, you can't enslave an enslaved person. (laughs) They're already enslaved. And so because his punishment was to be a slave for life, that really raises some questions about what status many of these people were. And also, it depended upon how they got here. Some of them were brought through this pirating system. Others were brought here from England as well as other places. So I think each person coming here, there was a different status because of how they were brought here. I prefer to use the term bonded or unfree simply because there was no system in place. There were lots of exceptions to this idea that they were held in bondage in perpetuity, and there was no law to really govern whether or not they were enslaved. So it sounds like it took Virginians some time to figure out what they meant by slavery and how they wanted to define how an enslaved person was different from a bonded person, which, as you noted earlier, a bonded servant could be either a black person or a white person. So when did Virginians become clear in their definition of who would be enslaved and what it meant to be enslaved? And When did Virginia make the shift from servitude to slavery? Throughout the 17th century, the laws and the practices refer to both white and black bonded people as servants. You wouldn't see until after the 1640s, Africans sometimes referred to as slaves. But even in the 18th century, I would look at some runaway slave ads, some of the court cases, Often they were still calling 
Black's servants, but they were not servants. And you could tell they were not servants because they were listed as serving for life. But because they were calling them servants, and you would look at the inventories of these plantations, some of these individuals owned both black and white servants or black slaves, white servants, but they worked together. And many of them in working together, if they tried to escape, they ran away together. And there seemed to be a much closer alliance between both black and white servants during really that time period, as opposed to what would happen later. And so when Bacon's Rebellion occurred in 1676, and you would see this sort of coalition of black and white servants working together to overthrow the Virginia government, there was an effort after that effort failed by the Virginia General Assembly to begin really setting apart so that black and white servants could not see themselves in the same boat, so to speak. So you would see laws being passed that were giving certain privileges and opportunities to white servants. And there was also incentives. They were trying to incentivize plantation owners not to hire or not to buy white servants instead to only buy enslaved black people. And so we would start seeing a slow shift away from white indentured servants to enslaved black people from that period going into the middle part of the 18th century. And this shift would really be significant because it was accompanied by a series of laws that were ensuring that whites were given privileges and were seen at a higher status level than blacks. And that was to put that wedge, even though the two groups still had a lot in common, it was to create the illusion that there was a real separation between those two groups. The law is something that has come up several times throughout our conversation. And creating rules and a system to enforce those rules were tasks that the Virginia Company gave to the First Assembly. So it really seems like rules and laws were essential to Virginia's shift from servitude to slavery. So why don't we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, and then we'll come back and explore links between Virginians' ideas about servitude, race, and the law. As our exploration has been revealing, 1619 was a momentous year. It saw the creation of the first representative assembly and the arrival of the first Africans in English North America. And these have been really important events, not only for Virginia, but also for the United States. Now, to commemorate these two milestones, and to explore how history has entwined with them over the last 400 years, the Commonwealth of Virginia founded the American Evolution Project. This project has hosted and sponsored exhibits, tours, and lectures throughout Virginia, and it'll continue to sponsor these events through the rest of the year. It's also sponsored a book. As part of the American Evolution Project, the Omohundro Institute has published Virginia 1619, Slavery and Freedom in the Making of English America. Now, This edited volume contains essays from 13 different scholars, and all the essays explore ways that slavery and freedom were born together in the quest to build a lasting colony in Virginia. Now, as a Ben Franklin's World listener, you can enjoy Virginia 1619 at a 40% discount. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash 1619 and use promo code 01BFW. Again, to enjoy a 40% discount off the cover price of Virginia 1619, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash 1619 and use promo code 01BFW. Cassandra, it seems like rules and laws were essential to Virginia's shift from servitude to slavery. So would you tell us about the links between Virginians' ideas about servitude, race, and the law, and how all those ideas became intertwined and encoded into Virginia's society and legal system? People who come from other areas don't divest themselves of their culture or their prejudices. And so many of the people who were coming to the Jamestown slash Virginia colony came here with their particular ideas about other people. And it seems that the English people especially were quite familiar with the transatlantic slave trade. Many of them had heard or read these accounts 
by other Europeans that depicted some of the Africans as inferior or as savages or barbarians. And so many of them came with preconceived ideas. In addition to that, you had still a lot of ethnic groups. England was certainly one of them who labeled other people, even in Europe, as somehow inferior to them. So they came here with those preconceived ideas, and those ideas really helped to frame the rulings. For example, there's the Elizabeth Key case, in which she was the child of an Englishman and an African woman. She was also a baptized Christian, but she had been held in bondage for 20 years, and she had filed a freedom suit asking that she be freed based on the fact that she was not only a Christian, but she was also a mulatto. And the courts ruled that she should be free primarily because her father was an Englishman of high standing. But then a short while after that decision was made, that's when the legislature passed a law saying that regardless of whether an African may be a Christian, that will not change their status. So in other words, they can be a Christian, they can claim to be a Christian, they can be baptized, but they will continue to be enslaved because the law of not enslaving a Christian only applied to white people. And so it seems that from the beginning, those notions, those racialized ideas really began to make their way into how people were treated and later on into how court cases were decided and how laws were written. Could you give us another example or two of how early English ideas about race and the inferiority of Black people informed early English laws and the workings of its legal system? Sure. So in the 1640s, we would see laws passed making African women tithable. This is a tax that you would pay. In order to be viewed as tithable, you had to be seen as a laborer, as someone who was contributing to society. And in the English mind, only men were tithable. But even in the 1640s, they made sure they made Black women tithable. So they were not seeing them as women. They were seeing them as laborers. And they actually passed two laws just because there was a little confusion, apparently, because they put in the second law just to keep anybody from being confused. This is what we meant. Black people, I mean, they were using terms such as Negroes. Both men and women are tithable. So in the law, they specifically were saying that Black men and women were to be treated equally as laborers, very different from the way that they were treating white women and white men. And then a short while after that, there was another law passed saying that the status of the child would follow that of Black women only. But for English women, the status of the child would continue to follow that of the man. So even when Africans were making up 2% of the colony's population, those laws were being passed to ensure that they would hold a very different status and would follow a very different practice than what would be there for English people, especially English women. So there was intentionality in creating a system, whether it was economic, social, religious, whatever, but creating a system that would demarcate Blacks as the other, as these laws that would provide citizenship, that would provide rights and privileges would not be applied to people of African descent. Yeah, laws are intentional. They're created to serve a specific purpose. And if you think about it, They often take a lot of time and effort to create and pass. So when we think about these slave laws that we've been discussing, what was their purpose and who benefited from creating the laws that defined slavery and separated whites from blacks economically and socially? 
So we would see between the 1660s and 1680s a series of laws that would give whites the ability, if they owned a person of African descent, they would put into the law that if you kill that person, you are not guilty of murder because they were now making that individual equal to property. That was not the case with white servants, but that became part of the law. You had other laws put in place that would later be known as the slave laws or the slave codes, where they would detail out what a slaveholder could do and what they were not liable for. And they could also get compensation if somebody accidentally harmed or killed that individual who was enslaved. There was no punishment for killing the person. There was only compensation given to the owner for the loss of that individual's labor or the loss of that individual's life. So this began to provide a sense of entitlement to whites that only their rights mattered. Only the law of murder or abuse was applied to them, not applied to people of African descent. That they had a right to do certain things to Black people. They could act any kind of way with impunity as opposed to feeling as if they had to treat people, these Africans and African descendants, as human beings. And so this creates a cultural set of assumptions that were fully in place by the end of the 17th century throughout all of the American colonies. But most importantly, if you are able to hold on to a person in perpetuity and their descendants in perpetuity, and you can do anything you want to this individual and you are not in violation of any law, then all the wealth that you are acquiring from their labor, you can even impregnate African women and sell your own children as if they're simply commodities and make money from it. You are then accruing wealth that is inheritable and you are depriving people, even if they get their freedom. In addition to the slave codes, always at the end of the slave codes, you had codes that governed what free blacks could and could not do. So they were limited not only to what kinds of occupations they could have, but pay and as well as whether they could own a gun, whether they could own property, where they could own property, et cetera, et cetera. So you're making sure that even those who became free would be limited and could not accrue wealth and pass that wealth on to their children while you could. And so this system that was put in place in the 17th century, we would continue to see even up to now. And I don't mean in terms of slavery, but I do mean in terms of inequality. So what has the legacy of the Virginia slave laws been? Did the Virginia Assembly and its slave laws inspire how other representative assemblies in English North America approached race and slavery? I would say very definitely it did, although Massachusetts, they passed slave laws a couple of decades before Virginia did. I like to say that it is important to understand these early years because the foundation of our nation, brick by brick, was laid during these early years, these early decades, starting here in Virginia and also including the Massachusetts colony. Because these laws, these practices were racialized from the beginning, this would be embedded into the very culture and fabric of American society and its legalized history. And so in order to deconstruct that, in order to reach a point of equality, you first have to do a deep dive into the very fabric of our legal system to remove all the underpinnings of this racial divide that was a part of the very fabric of our legal society in order to 
actually create a more equal society. And we haven't done that as a nation. And to make it worse, we also popularize this notion of equality for everyone, that the colony was there for opportunity. It created opportunity for a lot of English people and even some non-English people from Europe, but it created the opposite for people of African and Native descent. And I think it's time after 400 years that America comes to grips with its true roots and foundations and begin to look at our past differently. Because in order for us to have perspective now and to see how far we've come, we have to be honest about where we came from. Speaking of this 400-year anniversary, we noted at the beginning of our conversation that 400 years ago, in 1619, Virginia instituted the first representative assembly in English North America. And then a few weeks after that, the first African people arrived in the colony. Cassandra, was this a coincidence? Were there connections between the formation of the first representative assembly, the representatives who served in it, and the arrival of the first Africans? You know, in history, there are no coincidences. I say that history is filled with irony, that this body of people who started pretty much a little over a month before the first arrival would be that same body that would begin to help define the institution of slavery in America, that they would be the benefactors of those who arrived and their labor. I just think history has a sense of irony. And that's why it's so important for us to look at this time period and to see those two events as very much connected to the other. The other thing is that some of these individuals were connected with the Virginia Company of London. And the Virginia Company of London was involved with helping to raid these Spanish and Portuguese ships to bring Africans to the colonies. So we cannot forget that there was some sort of connection through their associations and investments globally. And what do you think it means to the African-American community today that Virginia is working to recognize the history of the first Africans and the roles they played in the founding of American culture during this quadricentennial commemoration? I think it is critical for all Americans to understand that what you've really been taught about the foundations of American society is not really the reality of the foundations of American society, that it is not just a transplant of English society and culture and laws and systems. Rather, This was a very messy time period. And by messy, I mean that no one came with a plan. They were making it up as they went along. But you did have people who did have power over the vast majority of the others. And they wanted to put in place laws that would make those privileges inheritable and ongoing. And it is important, I believe, for every American to understand that story in American history, not the myth-making that we have been taught. I'd like to see this commemoration begin to change the narrative so that we takes on a different definition and our narrative comes from a very different lens so that we understand, for example, that the emerging American culture was not just from England. You had tremendous influences from the native cultures, as well as from the various African cultures. And that it's those cultures and the existence of the people in society who were not European that helped to frame not just our culture, but also our political system. And we must understand that as we look from 2019 moving forward into our future. And as we look at our future, there are a lot of special anniversary commemorations taking place now and in the years to come across the United States. For example, we have 1619 this year in Virginia. Next year, we have the quadricentennial of 1620 in Massachusetts. And of course, 
there is the ongoing 250th anniversary of the American Revolution. And I know I've just mentioned a few prominent examples from early America. And I do wonder about commemoration of these anniversaries. Because if you think about it, when we focus on commemorating an anniversary, it really narrows our focus to specific people and events. And in doing that, we exclude other people and events. So I wonder if you would tell us why you think we commemorate and emphasize historical anniversaries and whether you think we should remember and commemorate historical anniversaries. I think that anniversaries should work two ways. Some should be commemorated and some should be celebrated. One of the things that we should never lose sight of is our past, because our past informs and in some cases directs our present and our future. And so we want to avoid ever being in an Orwellian world in which our past is only what I tell you right now, as opposed to what actually happened. And so these commemorations are really designed as a moment for us to remember, to reflect, and to assess whether our interpretation of that event is actually correct. And in this case, we're finding that with historians doing a deep dive once again into old records that have been long forgotten or lost in the shuffle, that we have had an inaccurate interpretation of that period in American history that we must now correct. And we must also put all efforts into uncovering who these people were who helped to build America, to build the colony of Virginia at its most critical period. While Virginia started in 1607 with the Jamestown Fort, there was actually no clear evidence that that colony would succeed and continue until 1619. To understand that this limited legislative body was formed in 1619 is a clear indication that there was confidence that the colony could survive. And then for a little over a month later, the arrival of these first Africans to the colony, the colony that now is going to survive. And that means that everything that's being done at that particular time would be foundational and everything laid and the kinds of culture would be created really at that moment. It is important for us to recognize that and not to remove the presence of people because they don't fit a certain narrative in which we want to celebrate something, but rather to look at this and say, we need to be very inclusive. And that also means stop extracting Native Americans as being inconvenient to our narrative. The moment Pocahontas died, you see in a lot of narratives, there are no more Indians here in Virginia. Well, of course, we know that's not true. In fact, until fairly recently, with the archaeological work that's being done, the narrative was that there were no Native peoples living in the Jamestown colony or living within the confines of the Jamestown fort. We're finding out that wasn't true. And there on William Pierce's plantation, some of those individuals buried might actually be Native peoples. And so this helps to change our understanding and the image that we have of that time period and who was there and how people interacted. And I think that that's critical to our perception of our past. And so commemorations help us to not only refocus our understanding, but it encourages historians to go back and re-examine those interpretations and hopefully come up with something that is newer, that's fresher, and that's more accurate to what actually occurred. Now we should jump into the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. 
opinion, what if Virginia had never passed racialized slave laws in the 17th century? How might the trajectory of race in American history have been different? Wow, <laughs> that is a challenging question. I don't know if our understanding of democracy would have been the same. With every horrible thing, there sometimes can be, in the long run, a positive outcome. The struggles that people go through sometimes build strength, but it also produces a lot of pain and lingering negative effects. And our system of slavery that lasted a very long time and was extended into the latter part of the 20th century through segregation is one of those legacies that still will take a long time for us to overcome. And had that not been there, then when we look at the trajectory of American history and society, it would have been very different. For example, during the American Revolution, when we had the British, starting with Governor Lord Dunmore from Virginia, offering freedom in exchange for the support by the African and African Americans against the American forces, and many of them did serve with the British, if that hadn't existed, if there had not been slavery or some form of bondage and discrimination, the war would have had a, perhaps a different outcome, in part also because the British were trying to stem some of the tide of the transatlantic slave trade, and the Americans were furious that the British were doing that. In fact, the American government or different governments, all these different American colonies, were sending ships to the West Indies trying to get more and more enslaved people. And they were very upset that England was not providing them with more enslaved people. And this is from about the 1720s through the beginning of the American Revolution. And so that whole dynamic would not have been there. And so would we have actually fought a war for independence? I'm not really sure. And so that one element could have impacted every aspect of our nation's trajectory. I think it's an interesting what if, but I think everything would have been different. There would not have been anything that would have been the same. So, Cassandra, what about your research? What are you researching and writing about? I just completed another article looking at the Underground Railroad in Hampton Roads. Virginia had the largest number of people seeking freedom through the Underground Railroad, especially in the antebellum period. Virginia was the largest colony throughout the entire period of the colonial years. It was the second largest state in terms of population in the country. And it was the largest in terms of people of African descent and continued to be the largest until close to the beginning of the 20th century. And so looking at Hampton Roads in particular, which it was the second largest departure point on the Underground Railroad, I'm sort of challenging some of the arguments that were made by historians in the past about the types of people who escaped through the Underground Railroad and looking at, well, what happened to some of the people? We know they escaped, but what happened later on in their lives? And I've uncovered some incredible stories. So I'm interested in debunking some of the myths that seem to really paint African-American men in a negative light, that somehow they just left their families because it was all about them and their families were left to fend for themselves. And there were many more complicated reasons why some of these men left on their own. And talking about that and really recasting the story from a very different perspective. That sounds fantastic. Do you know where your essay will be published? This particular article will be published in a book entitled Sailing to Freedom. And I hear you have a summit coming up. Would you tell us about it and how we can get in contact with you if we have more questions about Virginia's 1619 anniversary? At Norfolk State University, we are going to be hosting a 1619 Making of America Summit. It is on the 2019 
American Evolution website. And we hope that people will sign up to either come to our summit with a lineup of incredible panelists or watch it. It will be simulcast. So you have to register for that. But also at Norfolk State University, as a professor of history and dean of the college, we have a website where we are talking a lot about these topics and these important research areas that we're coming up with. And so we're actually about to launch a new section on our college website that not only focuses on a new initiative that we have, the Center for African American Public Policy, but also our Film and Humanities Institute, where we are taking these stories that we've researched and we're linking videos and research projects, digital humanities initiatives and other things to that website so that people can learn a lot more about these fascinating topics that have been out there, but only now people are researching. Cassandra Newby alexander Thank you for joining us and for helping us better understand the world of 1619 and Virginia's commemoration of it. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you about this. Historical commemorations are important. They remind us that history tells us who we are and how we came to be who we are. They also provide us with opportunities to explore how history is an iterative process. The past happened, but history is made. Each generation makes and creates histories. They do this work by looking at past events, going into the historical record, and by viewing the facts of what happened within the lens of their own time. This is important work, because again, history tells us who we are and how we came to be who we are. So it's only natural that each generation looks at its own present and attempts to trace how they came to it by looking at the past for clues. Now, historians undertake this important work of looking for and at historical facts with objectivity. But no matter how objective historians try to be, their objectivity is always colored by the context of their present. No matter how hard we try, none of us will know exactly what a past we didn't live in was really like. I do think historians can get us close to what the past was like with their research, but as frustrating as it is, we'll never arrive at exact answers. And I think that's okay, because a good work of history will tell you just as much about the past as it will about the time period the historian created it in. Which means that, collectively, we can use all works of history to chart how society has thought about the past and how those thoughts have changed or remain the same over time. And it's this ability to chart change and continuity over time that really tells us who we are and how we came to be who we are. Now, in terms of the important events that took place in Virginia in 1619, those events being the creation of the first limited representative legislature and the arrival of the first Africans in English North America, these events are connected, and we should view them as connected. As Cassandra noted, it wasn't a coincidence that the representatives who sat in the first limited legislature were also the men who established the first laws in English North America and the men who owned the first Africans. Nor was it a coincidence that the court and legal system created by the first limited legislature served as the foundation for the legalization of slavery. Now, it wasn't a coincidence because the men in the first limited legislature had power and wealth. Slavery was a system that increased and perpetuated power and wealth. So the men in the first legislature created a system that perpetuated power and wealth, which they passed on to their sons and grandsons, who in turn passed on more wealth and power to their sons and grandsons. Now, I know the histories of power and slavery are uncomfortable for most of us, and they're uncomfortable because they are messy histories about inequality. In 1776, Thomas Jefferson and the Second Continental Congress listed reasons and 27 grievances for why Americans must form an independent nation apart from Great Britain. And among the reasons the founders provided was that Americans hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, as we know from our conversations with other scholars in previous episodes, Every generation has interpreted these words from the Declaration of Independence differently. But what we can agree on is that this notion that all men are created equal set forth equality as one of the founding principles of the United States. And yet, the events of 1619 reveal that this major foundation of the United States, equality, was set atop a much earlier foundation of power and inequality. 
Which is why when we look at the history of the United States, we almost always see events, actions, and ideas filled with the conflict and tension between equality and inequality. Equality and inequality are oppositional ideas, and yet both serve as foundations of the United States. And that's the real power of this quadricentennial anniversary of 1619, isn't it? The commemoration of 1619 provides us with a moment to pause, see, and trace how every generation of Americans has struggled with the inequality that lays within their ideas and values of equality. You'll find more information about Cassandra, her scholarship, as well as links to events and resources about the Virginia 1619 commemoration on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 250. Don't forget, we have bonus materials for this episode. You'll find a list of additional resources and bonus audio about the world of 1619 at fastearlyamerica.com. Production assistance for this episode and for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital projects team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Emily Sneff, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, what do you think about historical anniversaries and commemorations? Do you think we should commemorate historical anniversaries like the quadricentennial of 1619, even if it means we might narrow our focus so much that we miss what was happening in the lives, actions, and events of other people? I know this is a big question, and I'm curious what you think about it. So let me know. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute, and production of this episode was made possible by a grant from the Roller Bottomore Foundation of Richmond, Virginia.